Hi everyone. Well, what a wonderful time of worship. Thank you, Tim, for leading us so well. Such beautiful songs. Uh, did me did me good. Hope it did you good, everyone out there too. Um, we're continuing our series on finding meaning in a messed up world, the book of Ecclesiastes in, in the Bible. And I want to speak today about the gift of joy and contentment. We're in chapter 6, and I'll read there from there in just a moment. But um, uh, if you've been watching over these last weeks, as we've gone through this book of Ecclesiastes, it's really highlighting the fact that life can be very frustrating. Uh, of course, especially just now, uh, even with shops just beginning to open, I read a report this week that apparently we're going to be grumpy shoppers because uh, things aren't quite how we expected them to be and we can't do this and we can't do that. Be careful we don't do do so and so. So um, we all know life can be frustrating. Now, the preacher or teacher, the guy who, was, who wrote Ecclesiastes, he knows all about the good things in life. In fact, um, he's, he wrote in, in chapter 4, verse 11, uh, he says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. And uh, then in, in, uh, in verse 12, he says, I know there's nothing better than for people to be happy. So he knows about these things. But, of course, the trouble is how we actually get to have lasting joy in our fleeting lives. Joy is so elusive. Um, our longings are strong, but uh, the, the, the fulfilment, what we actually get, it doesn't match up to it uh, most of the time. And... Uh, with that in mind, I, I, I want to speak about the gift of joy and contentment. So here we go. I'm in uh, chapter 6, and we're starting from verse 1. I've seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honour, so they lack nothing their hearts desire, but God doesn't grant them the ability to enjoy them. And strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless and a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he can't enjoy his prosperity and doesn't receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning, depart in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or never knew anything, it has more rest than does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years, twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Don't all go to the same place. Everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their appetite never satisfied. What advantage have the wise over the fools? What do poor gain by knowing how to conduct yourself before others? Better what the eyes see than the roving of appetite. This too is meaningless and chasing after the wind. And then verse 12. Who knows what is good for a person in life? During the few meaningless days they pass through like a shadow. Who can tell them what will happen under the sun when they are gone? Wow. I don't know if you noticed the word enjoy is there actually, I think, four times. A couple of times in verse 2, then verse 3, then verse 6. It, this quest for enjoyment. I mean, really, that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. A quest for last, lasting joy and, uh, and contentment. It's what we all want, isn't it? That's what we were made for. It's how we were wired, how we were created. And uh, I don't know about you, but, you know, when you see young children hopping, skipping, just just skipping along the road. It, there's something, uh, pavement, sorry. There's something lovely about that, just to see a, chi a child carefree, hopping, skipping, jumping, maybe even humming a tune. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And perhaps we can be a bit wistful. Oh, why does it have to be lost? Because as, as time goes on, they soon learn, it's not fair, and, 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 and so on. It, it, it's that frustration that um, the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to, uh, is teasing us really with questions to work out how we can find lasting, lasting joy. It's what we all want. We, we, we you know, can we avoid frustrations um, with uh, 
possessions. He starts off in verse 1. Um, God gives some people wealth, possessions, honour. It seems that even those things, it, they're, they're, we can have them in some measure, but they don't last. They, they seem to almost tantalise us and yet disappear before we can really enjoy them to the full. So we were... We were, we were wired, we were created with this longing, with this yearning to, to be able to put it, piece it all together. What my life's about, how it, how, how it works, how it's for. We want to find a, a way of, of viewing our lives that makes sense and give, give lasting contentment and, and joy. But our inquiry would seem to fail under under the sun. That's the phrase we've seen throughout this book when we exclude God under the sun. Our quest for lasting enjoyment ends up in frustration. And, it, and in verse 2, this is meaningless. It's a grievous evil, tantalised by so many things and yet left frustrated. And that's because it's a broken world. And, and surely we, we can all see that. But it, the world's not as it was meant to be. And if we go back to the beginning of the story, beginning of the Bible, in, in, in the early chapters of Genesis, in chapter, chapter 2, we see God created, made beautiful, and uh, it was pleasing. And then God placed mankind, Adam and Eve, in, in the Garden of Eden. Now, I don't know if you know that the, the, Eden is the Hebrew word for delight. That's what it means, Eden, delight. So there's this, there's this delightful picture uh, of of mankind in, in enjoying God's good creation, and then I think it also says that God created uh, trees and, and and so on that were, were were beautiful to behold, and we know that's true. There's there's beauty in 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 the creation around us, and yet it goes on to speak about what we call the fall, how mankind cho chose rather than God's agenda and honouring him in life to say, no, no, I'm going to do things my way. They chose self-determination. I'm not going to listen to, to God's voice in this. I, I, I don't want his agenda. I don't want his lordship. I want to do my own thing. And so it, it, creation became broken, a frustration. We sp he speaks there in Genesis about um, the curse. Life on earth became frustrating. And that's really why we see all these frustrations that we've been seeing going through the book of, of Ecclesiastes. So, so instead of being delightful and fruitful, life became cursed and frustrating. And you don't have to look very far to see that that's, that, that's very true. We want lasting happiness but it just eludes us. Relationships that offer so much can so often fail to deliver, become broken. Re fractured relationships. Um, our health may be, our jobs, things can be taken from us so quickly and we're left frustrated. And really, it stems back to what happened there in the Garden of Eden. You see, we, our lives we, we, we're, ne we're never meant to orbit around the focus of I, me, myself. We were made for a different orbit. We were made to, to, to orbit God himself, around hi to orbit around him. That he should be the centre of our universe if we want it all to, to work. So we get to this frustrating uh, verse that I read, verse 12, the end of chapter 6, it, it, having, going back to verse 1, it weighs heavily on us that we can, we can, be, t we can be sort of teased with wealth, possessions and honour, but never get to enjoy it with a lasting joy. And then he ends up in verse 12, who knows what is good for a person in life? A kind of a despairing cry, isn't it? Who knows what's good for a person in life during the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow. In fact, the, the message translation of the Bible puts it like this. Who knows what's best for us as we live out our meagre smoke and shadow lives? Who can tell us of the next chapter in our lives? Well, I want to introduce you in these last few moments to someone who unexpectedly found someone who could tell her about the meaning of her life and what 
the future holds. And I want to take you to a lady who uh, you may have heard about, a, lady, a woman at, the, at a well, uh, middle of the hot day, uh, on her own, going about her chores on her own. And uh, she had this unexpected encounter with Jesus. Let me read to you from John and chapter 4. And it says there that Jesus had to go through Samaria and he was uh, near a plot of ground that Jacob had given to his sons. And Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was, sat down at the well. And a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And uh, you, you may know the story there. Um, the, the woman kind of gets a bit confused. You've got no, nothing to draw water with and yet you're offering me water. And then he goes on to say, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I'll give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give them will become in them like a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And um, Jesus then really opens her up uh, with, with a question. He, he says, go and get your, your husband. And, and she says, oh, well, I, haven't, I haven't got a husband. And Jesus says, yes, you're right. You've, you've had five. And the, the man that you now live with is not your husband. And um, at that moment, this, this dear lady sees that Jesus, the, man, the person standing in front of her, sees right through, right to the core of her being, all her frustrations and past experiences. He, he knows her through and through and offers her something beautiful. Uh, Tim Keller um, uh, a pastor and writer he says this about this exchange he said Jesus saw her to the bottom and loved her to the skies that's what Jesus does he knows us so very well sees right through all our deflecting questions she tried to deflect him with some, some uh, questions about religion but Jesus saw right through to her, saw her life, saw her frustrations, saw her longing, saw her aching and loved her and offered her something satisfying and lasting. It's what Jesus does. That's, that's the, the gospel. That's what it means to be a Christ one, a Christian, that we've encountered Jesus. God in the flesh coming to show us the way back dying on the cross to 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 take upon himself all of our rebellion and our, our, our mess and rising again in newness of life and offering us future hope eternity with him this is this is the christian message when i preached last time from Ecclesiastes, I, I, I ended up going into Colossians chapter 1 in the New Testament and I'll, I'll read those verses again. Speaking of Jesus, it says this, The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things and in him all things hold together. You see, knowing Jesus, we, we've just been singing that, that wonderful sing, that wonderful song. Knowing you, I love it. You Knowing you, Jesus. I've got to sing it. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. It's, this is the heart of being a Christian. We've had an encounter with Jesus. We, 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 we've had him, as it were, come to us like the woman at the well and, and see right through all our deflecting questions and see the longing of our hearts and loved us and offered to us himself and new life in him.
that, that, that's what a Christian is. And this dear lady, she's so impacted by this, this encounter that she rushes back into town to, to tell her, her friends and neighbours, come and see a man who, who told me everything I ever did. I think it, in the message it says something like, um, uh, come see a man who knew all about the things I did, who knows me inside out. That's Jesus. He knows you. He knows you. And he loves you. He died for you and he lives for you. And he, he, he holds out his hand to you to say, I want to bring you out of frustration into fruitfulness, into lasting joy with a wonderful future hope. That's what he came to, to bring. And, and I, I want to ask you the question, have you encountered Jesus? You may have touched religion. You may, have, you may think you understand Christianity, but have you encountered Jesus? In the, like this lady did in a life-changing way. I, I quoted a few times a quote from Andrew Wilson at New Day back in the summer, last summer, when he said, um, if you think you've encountered Jesus but your life hasn't changed, you, you probably haven't. Because he has such an impact on you when you open your, 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 your heart to him and, uh, and you encounter him in, in, in that way. It, it, you can't be the same again. He's, it goes on to say here there in John 4, lots of other people in town, because of this lady's personal story, they, 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 they started to follow Jesus. They gave their lives to him. And, and it says they, they, they recognized, surely he is the savior of the world. That's what he is. That's who he is, the savior of the world. And my goodness, does the world need a savior? So if you've never encountered Jesus, and you're watching this this morning, go speak to a, a, a friend that you might know who's a Christian. Ask them what it is. Ask them to, to tell you more. You, you can drop us a line from the, 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 the email address on, on our website. Best of all, you can just perhaps make your, your first prayer. Lord Jesus, if you're there, if you're there, if you're real, please. Reveal yourself to me. I, I, I want to explore more. You see, Jesus, he, he stands up to inquiry. He, he's fine with that. In fact, <laughs> there's, there's so much to be revealed when you do start inquiring and seeking after him. So I want to encourage you in that if you've never encountered Jesus. Take a, a good look and see if you're not surprised. And then secondly, I want to speak to Christians, and I just want to make sure that your relationship with Jesus hasn't gone stale, perhaps choked with all the stuff going on around in the world around us. Perhaps you've lost your wonder, lost your joy, maybe your head's gone down. And I, I want to say to you this morning, please, 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 don't, don't stop inquiring. Continue to... May, may, may wonder con continue to warm your heart as you explore, as you open your heart to him. And if you've gone stale, please, I, I, I would encourage and invite you today, get on your knees afresh and say, Lord Jesus, I want a fresh encounter with you. I don't want to go stale. Because here's the thing, this time in our culture, there's a lot of people who need to know who the saviour of the world is. And the best testimony is your joyful life, despite circumstances around you, because you have a living experience of Jesus. Don't lose your wonder. It's, it's so important in, in our, our, Christian, our Christian life. There's always more to be discovered. So may your devotion to the Lord Jesus be fresh. If, and hey, if you just sort of sat through that worship a while ago, when we finish here, go back, play it again. Maybe, I don't know, get on your own, close the door if you feel self-conscious, or, or when you're in the bath, or whatever, and just express your devotion to the Lord. That's what song is. Song is an expression of our, our wonder, our, our delight, our gratitude. And it articulates it rather than letting it just become stale in our lives. That's why I'm always going on about 
song and worship. Hey, the Bible's full of it because, hey, we were created for the glory of God to express our worship to him. So may your devotion to Jesus be fresh every day. How? Two things, and I close with this. First, with the Bible, the living word of God. Please avail yourself of this precious resource. Uh, J.I. Packer, one of my favourites, he says this, the Bible is our lifeline. It's the rope God throws us in order to ensure that we stay connected while the rescue is in progress. Okay, because we, until uh, we get to be with him, there's still going to be challenges, but we've got this wonderful rope that we can hold on to. That's the first thing, uh, the Bible. And the second thing, worship. Keep your worship living and alive. Another writer, Walter Brueggemann, he says this, songs are lyrical articulations of celebration, amazement and gratitude. So please have a fresh encounter with the Lord Jesus. May your, your walk with him just be enriched each day. There's more to be discovered. You'll never get to the end of the, the beauty, the wonder of who Jesus is until you see him face to face. Speaking of which, we're now going to sing a beautiful song. There is a day. There is a day. A day coming that all creation is waiting for. When we will get to see Jesus in all his glory. May you approach that day as someone loving and longing to meet the Lord Jesus and not fearful and trying to escape his gaze. The Lord bless you. Let's enjoy this song now. Let's live with that wonderful sense of future hope based on our devotion to Jesus.